Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. Let's talk about mythic fantasy. While Exalted may have been my introduction to this style of play in a role-playing sense, there's always something appealing about this genre. This presentation of larger-than-life characters accomplishing things that seem outside the realm of possibility is a tradition that goes back all the way to the mythological epics of old. After all, Webster defines epic as a long narrative poem in elevated style recounting the deeds of a legendary or historical hero. I'm sure from that description alone you can think of a few stories you've read or seen that certainly fit. And guys like the always awesome Professor Gee could argue that modern superheroes inherit that nature. This brings us to this week's entry, Mythender, a metal-inspired fantasy game that is all about those beyond-human heroes ending gods, while always being wary of the words of Nietzsche. Do not fight with monsters, lest you become one. How does it hold up? Let's find out. Mythender runs at 277 pages, and presents itself like a one-man operation, mostly because it is. The way it's written gives the impression as if designer Ryan Macklin is describing the rules to the reader as you're sitting there. That said, it is a little bit padded due to the spacing and the use of a single column format. The only issue I have is the lack of summaries in a few places, but on the plus side, it does follow the index rule. Always important. Mythender is intended to be a game of larger-than-life individuals challenging pantheons and legends. We'll be exploring this with our sample character, Eric, a king who views the gods as abusing their authority. The first step is to choose the Mythender's heart, past, and fate. This is the reflection of the type of Mythender they've become in the present, the mortal they were in the past, and the god that they're fated to become. In our case, we'll go with warrior, noble, and judgment, respectively. Second is weapon. This consists of important ideas or items that are given power through their mythic heart, the means that Mythenders use to unmake the gods. Weapons take one of three forms. Intrinsic ones are qualities from within, relic weapons are personal items of power, and companion weapons are those who would fight and die at your side. We'll go with one of each. Peerless skill with the halberd as an intrinsic, ancestral polearm as a relic, and a chapter of retainer soldiers as companion. Third is the damning aspect of the Mythender's fate. This starts with their general appearance in the mortal form, along with the progressive form as a paragon, supernatural, and godly, representing the Mythender becoming the very thing they would hunt. This is also reflected in the fate's powers part of the sheet. As a final part, we'll start with a gift based on our heart, in this case, relentlessness, with a might cost of 2, a storm rating of 3, 5 might tokens, and a wound cost of 3. Character creation is appropriately narrativist though it could be argued that it does that too much. Most of the mechanical breadth of life of characters, it's outside creation, and the fact that you only start with one gift doesn't exactly help matters. Your knowledge may vary on this, but my issue here is the lack of options within creation. It's mostly in the form of core mechanics or in descriptiveness. Mythender uses a d6 dice pool. A lot of d6s. However, you're not necessarily rolling to succeed or fail, but how powerful your effects are. After describing an attempt action, you roll a number of lightning and storm dice, each granting effects whether a four or higher is rolled. Successful thunder dice grant a lightning token, and successful storm dice grant you a thunder die to use next time. Lightning tokens are the effect resource, which you can then spend to inflict a wound on a target or to create blights. The other additional resource you have is might, of which you gain two of each turn and is used to power your gifts. Gifts have variable costs rooted in their base, and several have upgrades they may take advantage of. Blights can be considered the effects of power that alter the environment. Creating a blight costs two lightning tokens, and destroying one costs three for each charge on it. During battle, you may charge a blight to gain a bonus storm die, or erase all charges on that one to gain that many bonus thunder dice. Weapons are key to your actions, and when using them in action, you either charge one column or drain the charge column and gain the appropriate bonuses, ranging from extra dice to an additional might. The final die type is the mythic die which is rolled when you take an action above Legendary. When this is done, you roll this die and gain that many Thunder Dice. After the effects are resolved, you gain one point of Corruption. If the die result is higher than the Corruption chosen, you gain an additional check on the Fate track, gaining a further slot and potentially ris risking Apotheosis, i.e. becoming a god, by rolling a die and comparing it to the checked number on the Fate track. In a way, the die system here reminds me of the mechanical trinity of Karma, Aiki, and Kiai from Tenra Bancho Zero. 
In practice, it's not as daunting as it appears, but I think MythEnder suffers from a presentation issue. I wouldn't be surprised if someone's made a flowchart on how types interact. And to that end, I could see a theme of balancing immediate effects or building it for later. All of this makes a system that certainly fits its intended goal. It's just one that's presented worse than it actually is. MythEnder is a game that wears its heart on its sleeve. An admirable quality, to be sure. The fact that I end up comparing it to Japanese tabletop further indicates that this is a game meant for short-term or off-and-on play instead of long narratives. While it accomplishes this fairly well, there's a couple elephants in the room that I need to address. First, the context of mechanics doesn't vary often, as it's intended to come from the narrative aspects. Once again, your mileage will vary on this, but ultimately it's going to come off as window dressing depending on their background. And by that I mean their gaming background, not the background of the characters. Secondly, the usage of three different colored dice might be a turnoff for some, since that's not entirely how most people collect their dice bags. At least it's not how I do. The latter is more of a nitpick, but it is something that might cause issues, along with the fact that you're going to need a lot, and I mean a lot, of D6. Even more so than Shadowrun. All things said, I feel confident in giving this game a stamp of recommended. It's certainly a very rough diamond, but a diamond nonetheless. Once the party has a handle on how the die types are meant to interact, it'll be off to a much stronger start. But if your background is more tactically minded, I can't quite recommend it, as there won't be enough specialized crunch to satisfy. Either way, if you love larger than life in your campaigns, you can't go wrong here. Stay frosty!